Okay. All right, welcome back. So I promise you that I'm working on fixing this. I have some new hardware arriving. Uh, I think when you guys come all in and sit down, you guys fraud the Wi-Fi pretty hard, so it just takes a few minutes for things to stabilize. So, sorry about that. Welcome back. Um, so today what we're gonna do is, there's not a lot of new content today. Um, we have a couple of things to talk about that are kind of clarifications or additions to the knowledge that you already know, or the things that we've already presented at least. But what we're gonna do that's fun and exciting is we're gonna work on some problems together. So that's kind of the, what's gonna consume us for the second half of class. I have a few things to talk about now. Uh, again, more clarifications, a little bit of additional information about a couple of things that we've been working with that we need to explain a little better. Um, and then we'll do a couple of problems together and get some practice doing that. All right, so, and, and this is sort of our goal throughout the rest of the semester. We're getting to the point. I think of this class as layers. So we're getting to the point where we're kind of like, we put down the first layer of information that you guys need to know. Uh, this is something that once we start talking about objects um, in a week, you guys will start to refer to it as imperative programming. That's what we've been doing. Basic building blocks of, oh, it's doing this again, okay. Um, basic building blocks of uh, computer programs. And then what we're gonna do when we start the second unit of the class is we're gonna continue to work on developing our problem solving skills, but we're gonna start to include and introduce some new tools, objects, which is a, a new way of structuring data. And then when we get to the third half of the class, we'll actually start diving even deeper into some algorithms and data structures. So essentially, the stuff that you've seen so far, we're gonna keep practicing throughout the rest of the semester. So if you're a little bit, if you're struggling a little bit with some of the homework problems or in the CBTF on the quizzes, that's okay. This stuff doesn't go away. It's the foundation on which we build everything else that we talked about in the class. All right, so before we get to the problems, I wanna talk a little bit more about functions because uh, technically, um, I was here on Monday. Um, but actually first, before we start that, I wanna take a moment to just see how people are doing. So this is the end of the third week of class. Um, I hope people are okay. Um, you know, again, this is maybe the end of your third week in college, which is kind of exciting. Does anyone have any general concerns or questions uh, that they wanna ask? Um, you know, we're getting to the point where the MP is starting to, MP0 is starting to heat up, which is awesome. I see a lot of people working on that, which is great. Um, we have office hours today. The weekend office hours this weekend are obviously gonna be really important. Anything you wanna ask, any concerns? Yeah. When will the official MP grader be up? So that depends a lot on how much free time I have between now and Sunday night or Monday night. I'm working on that. Uh, we're close. Um, we've decided for some reason to rebuild this part of the class this semester um, and uh, we're not finished yet. Um, so I apologize for that. Uh, once it's, uh, so, so just let me make something very clear. The MP grader performs the same operation that you perform locally when you grade your MP. So when you run the grade IntelliJ configuration or when you hit the shield on the plugin if you've installed it, um, that's exactly what we do when we grade your assignment official. The only thing we do is that, you know, we, we copy over some of our test suites and stuff like that to make sure that you haven't made any changes. So for example, we're not gonna grade your assignment if all you've done is taken all the test cases and have them return, you know, pass or whatever, right? So we do a couple of things to your submission to make sure that we trust it, and then we run the gray task. But if you haven't made any changes to those test suites and you're running the gray task locally, that will do the exactly same thing that it does when we run it officially. This is really important to us. I want you to have confidence that when you submit something, you're gonna get the score that you think. Because let me point out something else. Even once we have the auto grader up and running and I have like a whole fleet of machines at my disposal here, particularly around deadline times, stuff backs up a little bit, right? You might have to wait half an hour, an hour to see your official score on a submission. So you really need to get to the point where you trust that local grader. And in order to allow you to do that, like I said, when we officially grade your assignment, there's no tricks. We don't have any hidden test suites. We don't do anything differently. We essentially run the same tool that you have, you know, within your IntelliJ installation. So you can do the same thing that we do. So when you see the score, it's like I got 40, you got 40. 
Again, as long as you didn't monkey with the test suites or do something weird, right? The whole goal of giving you this grader, which is another piece that, that we built, uh, Ben built this version of it, but I built the original version of it a couple years ago, is to allow you to have confidence in your submission, right? We don't want you submitting to find out what score you're gonna get, we'll tell you. And again, as long as you haven't done something weird, you will get the same score efficiently. It's a great question. Other questions, yeah. Yep. Eventually there will be. So once the grader works, when you push, after a few minutes or longer, depending on when you push and how many other submissions we have to grade, you'll see an official grade on the grade scale. Yeah, ab absolutely. That was working until we decided to break it again this semester. But once it's working again, it'll actually be working a lot better. Um, you guys won't notice, you don't really care how the stuff works, but uh, having to maintain this stuff, we do care how it works and, and the changes we're making are gonna help us. Yeah. You can submit as many times as you want. Look, I will do nothing this semester to prevent you from practicing. I promise you that. That's a commitment I will make to you. You don't lose credit on the homework problems. You don't lose credit on the MP for submitting multiple times. We will grade every single commit that you push, and you will get the best score out of any of those commits. Okay, so there is no penalty for trying. Right? That's how you learn this stuff. Right? Don't, I'm not going to penalize that. At some point you run out of time, okay? I'm not giving you an infinite amount of time to complete these. We need to keep you on track, right? We need to keep you moving forward. But, yeah, there, there's no penalty for pushing. Good question. Question or stretch it? Question, yeah. Is there a visualization? What would you like to see about it? Um, so, it, a video showing you, what, what would you like the video to show you? Yeah, so the question is, is there a visualization about how the game works? I'll, I'll ask Ben to see if he wants to do that, right? You, but you can, I don't know if you saw this in the MP0 instructions, but if you want to, you can build a fully working version of the game right now with the code you already have. You have to change this configuration file, but we've given you uh, solutions in a compiled, obfuscated form uh, that you can't use to figure out how to do the MP, but we've given you essentially the solution to the MP. That's already included. So if you want a fully working, um, uh, you want to see where you're going to get over the next two months, you can build that right now. All right, and experiment with it. But I, that may be a good idea. I may ask Ben if he wants to put together some sort of screen cap to give you a sense of how the game's supposed to work once you're done. Yeah. So, so this semester, you're, you are working on this project until Thanksgiving. Yeah, we've broken it down into specific pieces. Um, so, you know, uh, not this weekend, but next weekend, once you guys are done with the first checkpoint, we'll release a second checkpoint, and that'll have more things for you to work on, right? So yes, we're basically, you are gonna be, fin you're gonna be completing this app in stages, right, over the course of the next few months. And, and that's actually, something that, you know, I hope you guys appreciate because it allows us to do some really cool things. So some of the staff have pointed out like, oh, the first, like th these functions you guys are writing are terrible. They take like eight arguments, they're so gross, you know. And part of the reason for that is we haven't taught you how to use objects yet. Once we do that, um, I think you're actually gonna go back and rewrite some of this code to use objects and you'll see how much cleaner it is, how much nicer it is. But we don't know that yet. So the only thing you can do is work with an array of doubles that represents latitudes or whatever, right? You guys will see how much objects help simplify some of these parts of the MP once we teach you them and have you use them on a later MP check. So this is actually a really neat thing about working in the same project over a long period of time. And again, this is something that is, you know, uh, in the future when you're a software developer, you will do. I do this myself. I find out something new about something I'm doing and then I go back and I rewrite parts of the code I'm working on to reflect that new knowledge, right? So this doesn't stop with this MP or any of the checkpoints on it. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Nope, nope, so we've recorded every one of your pushes. We just haven't done anything with them yet. Yeah, 
So, so once the, and, and you know what? I'm gonna make you, uh, I'm, I'm gonna make a prediction. We may mess this up a few times, right? So the first time we run it, the grade might be wrong, and then we may run and rerun it and rerun it, but we have everything, we, we know when you pushed, and we know what you pushed. So at some point in the future, there will be a correct grade for that push, right? So as long as you push before the deadline, we have noted it somewhere, you know, when you submitted the code, and so you don't need to worry about pushing again later. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? It's been great. Okay, so let me, let's go back to talk about functions again. So on Monday we talked about functions. And one of the things that Ben told you, ah, this is nice this semester, because I get to get away with this. One of the things that Ben told you was that two functions couldn't have the same name. So this turns out to be not true. Um, and, you know, so I, I went, I, I, I've always liked this article. Um, so this is, you know, now 10 years old, but, um, you know, here are 10 warning signs of a bad professor, right? Um, the professor is boring, right? I don't consider myself to be that boring, but who knows? I'm, now I'm turning off the lights in the back, so some of you guys may be sleeping back there. Um, professor is bummed out, doesn't give out a syllabus. A professor assigns an undoable amount of work. I may be guilty of that sometimes. Um, petty rules, can't fill the whole class period. Well, you know, if I keep rambling and, and running music five minutes in the class, that's not a problem. Um, there's, but there's no, like, lies on this, right? That should probably be on the list. Like, the professor, you know, directly lies to you. Um, so here's an example. So again, I told you that the two functions couldn't have the same signature. And here's an example of that not being the case. So if I run this code, this is a snippet of code, I'm declaring two functions. The first one is, and, and like, we've done in the past, just ignore that static keyword. That's gonna make more sense in a few minutes. But for right now, what do I have declared here? I have two functions. On line one, I've declared a function called sum. That function takes two arguments that are both integers and returns their sum. So I have my return type, which is an int, the name of the function, open parentheses, I have a list of arguments separated by commas. Every argument looks like a variable declaration, it has a type and a name. So that says if you pass me two integers, I'll return the sum. But then, in the same spot, I have this other function called sum. Okay, so it's the same name. It also takes two arguments, but those arguments are, in this case, doubles, and it returns a double. And it turns out that I can use both of these in the same piece of code. So in the first case, I'm adding two ints, and in the second case, I'm adding two doubles. And just so you, you know, you might think, well, maybe the second one overrides the first one or something like that, right? Um, but let me show you that that's not the case. So if I comment out this second function, I'm gonna get an error, right? The error is being produced, and we'll talk about why this is happening in a minute, but the error is being produced because I need this second sum function in order for my code to work properly. So what's happening here? So the first thing we might wonder is, you know, before we were saying we need to have a name for the function so that we can use it in our code. So if I have two functions named sum, which I do right here, how do you think Java tells them apart? So these functions have the same name, but there is something different about them. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's one question. Is the return type, right? So one of them returns an int, one of them returns a double. Um, turns out that that's, let, let's, well, okay, so let's, let's experiment with this hypothesis. Let's say I'm gonna return an int. I also have to do this, which I'll explain in a second. Um, oh, this doesn't like this. This. Okay. I'll explain what I just did in a minute, but I just want to show you. So again, we're just messing around here, right? Um, but it turns out that I still have these two functions. They still both seem to work, um, even though they have the same return type. So that was a great hypothesis, but it's not, doesn't look like it's correct. Let's just put a print out in here so we can convince ourselves that both of these are, in fact, running, and they are. 
So how is, okay, so that was one hypothesis. Good hypothesis, not, not correct. What's happening? Yeah, so it's the type of the argument. Ah, okay, so now this, this, uh, okay, so now I have another hypothesis, which is that I can declare multiple functions with the same name as long as their arguments are different. So let's experiment with this hypothesis. Let's declare, let's change our second sum function to take two ints and see what happens. Okay, so if I do that, now I get this error from the compiler saying that I've already defined a method called sum. And it's actually really interesting because look at how the compiler identifies this method. It says method sum, but it just doesn't use the name. It also includes the argument types. So essentially what the Java compiler is complaining about here is that I've already defined a method called sum that takes two integers as arguments. And so in Java, what we, when we define a function, Java actually uses what's called the method signature to identify it when we try to use it. The method signature contains not only the name, but also the arguments and their types, the number of arguments and their types. So if I wanna make this different, let's say I wanna make a second sum function that also takes ints and returns an int, what do I have to do to make it different? I have to do something to distinguish it. So I already have one that takes two ints, yeah. I could change the name, that's true, right? So I could say another sum, right? Now, now I have this different problem here. Let me just get rid of this guy, right? Okay, so that, that works. I'm not calling this one, right? Um, what if I wanted to use the same name? What could I do? Yeah. I could add another argument or another parameter, yeah. So let's do this. Let's just say, and now I can re remove these casts, which we're gonna talk about in two seconds say first plus second plus third. So now I have two sum functions, one uh, sums two arguments, and second sums three arguments. Yeah. So something about the combination of the name of the function and the arguments and their number of arguments and their types has to be different in order for Java to figure out which one I want to use. So when this code runs, or actually when it compiles, what happens is Java says, okay, I can see you're calling a function named sum, and I can see that this is a function named sum that takes two arguments that are integers. Okay, well I know about that. You told me that that function existed up here, and you implemented it, so I know what it does. Same thing down here, it says, okay, well now you're calling another function named sum, um, but this one takes three integer arguments, and again, you told me what this function does, so I know how to, to call it. Okay. So this is something that's known as method overloading. And this turns out, we will come back and mention this again later, because this turns out to be connected with a really powerful and interesting feature of the Java programming language. Okay, for now we're just gonna you know, kind of talk about how it uses, but this is actually a type of polymorphism, right, which we will get to later. It's a big scary word that we'll talk about more when we talk about objects. So Java uses both the function name and the list of argument types to determine which function to call. Combining those together, we refer to them as the function signature. So again, if I remove um, this function and force the compiler to print an error message, you'll see an example of a function signature, right? This is a function signature, it's the sum, and then the types of the arguments. Java doesn't care what I call them, that doesn't help it, so for example, if I change the name of one of the parameters, I still have the same problem, right? The names are for me, right? The types are for Java. If I change this parameter to a double, it would work. Um, or if I added a third parameter that was in it, it would work, right? But this is an example of a method signature. Okay, awesome. Um, so this is how Java figures out what function to call. It looks for a function with the right name, and then it looks for a function that accepts the parameters that I'm passing. Right? So it needs to take those arguments in the right order with the right types. Okay. Right. And, and Java will also do type conversion to try to find a match as long as there's no loss of precision. Now what does this mean? Let's come back and talk about this in a minute. Well actually, we're gonna talk about it right now apparently. Okay, so I can run this code and I can see that it sums ints and sums doubles. Now before, when I removed one of the functions, I was very careful about which one to remove. So let me do this again. Let's remove the one that sums ints. 
All right, so that still works. Huh. It's interesting. What's going on here? It looks like on line 11, I'm calling a function called sum that should take two integers as arguments, not two doubles. So what is happening here? What is happening here? Remember I could do, remember, remember this? Let me jog your memory a little bit here. Remember I could do this? I could say double d is equal to 10. That works fine. 10 is an int. D is a double. Why can I do that? Yeah. Yeah, so there's no information that's lost here. I can't do the opposite. I can't take an int. I can't type an int. I can't take an int and, and uh, add and, and save a double value to it, but I can do the opposite. So as long as there's no loss of information, Java will do this. It will convert things for you. So it can take an integer value and it can cast it automatically to a double. We're gonna see how to get it to cast things when there is loss of precision or loss of information in a minute, okay? So what happens here when I call this function on line 12? The first thing Java does is it says, do I know about a function called sum that takes two integers as arguments? And the answer is no. I have not defined that function. I commented that function out. So now it goes through a process of trying to figure out, okay, well I know that I can take an integer and I can, um, I can use it as a double because I'm not losing information. So let's try that. Let's try to take this and use it as a double. Is there a function called sum that takes, you know, uh, any combination of types that I can, that I can convert these to? And so eventually it finds that there's a function called double that takes, so, so, sorry, sum that takes two doubles. So what it will do is it converts those integers to doubles. There's no, integers can't save a floating point component, so there's no loss of information. And then it calls the function sum. And you can see which one it's using, not only because I put a print statement in here, because the result is, is also a double. Okay. okay. All right, so now let's start to talk about, and this is something that, you know, you guys are gonna, uh, is really gonna come in handy on the upcoming homework problems and on your MP. So let me talk about, you know, this is really something that is not a rule. Uh, it's something that we sometimes refer to as a design pattern. It's a best practice for how to write a particular piece of code or type of code. And one of the things that you will have to do when you write functions, so pretty much throughout the rest of the semester, most of the homework problems and the MP are gonna consist of you completing functions. You're already doing that for the first MP checkpoint. You have a couple of functions, three functions that you need to work on, okay? When you start implementing a function, one of the things that is useful to do is to try to figure out if there's any problems with the arguments that you've been passed. This is sometimes known as input validation or parameter validation. So, for example, um, if I wanted to make uh, a function that summed all of the numbers in this array, I'm passing you an array of numbers. Um, one of the things I might want to do before I start doing any work, before I actually start implementing my algorithm, is check to make sure that numbers is sane, that it's okay. There's a, there's at least one serious problem that arrays in Java can have. And I'm gonna show you that in a second. All right? So let's, let's not, Let's not do this for now, okay? So here, here's what can go wrong. Let's say we skip this, okay? Uh, I don't know how to do that. I'll just put that in there. And so now I'm gonna just implement my sum function. I'm gonna take all of, I'll use an enhanced for loop to take each value from number, and then I'll return that sum. Okay, and then let's see if this works. So let's do system.out.println sum of one, two, five. Oh, I need to do this new int. All right, so I'm gonna create a array of ints right in there. It works, okay. So I feel like I'm feeling good here. I feel like I'm done, right? But here's the problem. There 
is an input to this function that will cause it to crash. So I'm going to tell you what that input is in a minute. But there is a way that an evil person, or as you guys are finding out in this chapter in Coders on Bugs, just like, you know, a user that didn't understand what you wanted them to do, right? Somebody put, you know, the wrong input in a text, you asked their phone number and they put their email address, right? You asked for their email address and they put die computer code, you know? Like, who knows, right? People do strange things. Um, so, let me sh show you this special, so actually one of the, I think somebody asked this a while ago, which is like, what's the value of an uninitialized array? So before I initialize an array, what value does it have? Is it empty? No, so in Java, we have this special value called null. And I, I wish, I mean, I could, you could give an entire class talking about null. Null is a fascinating topic. It is, it, you guys go and Google around, you will find all sorts of articles on null. There are people that refer to null in Java as the billion dollar mistake. Because it has caused so many problems with software. This empty value, this value that means that something doesn't exist. And I'll show you why it causes problems in a minute. But in Java, I have this special literal value called null. Once we start talking about objects, this will make a little bit more sense. But essentially, null means that an object reference doesn't refer to anything yet. So here I've declared an array, but I haven't used the new keyword to create an array that this array variable refers to. And so it's just no, it doesn't exist. It's like it points to nothing, okay? So, so, and this is this special value in Java. And again, like, I would encourage you because it, it, it just, this, a slide can't do it justice, but this is so interesting, right? There are, one of the, you know, so, uh, one of the languages that we started to use a lot as we developed tools for this class is a language known as Kotlin. And one of Kotlin's big design principles is null safety. It tries to make your code safe from problems involving this special value. So this weird null absence of stuff turns out to have deep implications for your code, okay? So null, is not a valid object, array, or anything. It has no properties or methods. So any attempt to do anything with it is going to fail. Fail spectacularly, okay? Attempts to use null are gonna result in a runtime crash, which is terrible. That means your app, that means when you deploy your app to the App Store or to the Play Store, people get that, you know, fun app has stopped working. Like, that's the message that they see. It's not good. Okay? All right, so let's, let's go back and, and I'm gonna show you what happens here, all right? So, let's say that, you know, I'm a user and I just wanna see the world burn. Boom, there it is. I have created a problem. I have crashed your code, you know? And, you know, <laughs> I hope that this happens when you run your tests as opposed to when you're, you know, uh, out in Silicon Valley pitching to some VC showing them your brand new, um, you know, cool app and it crashes, right? Not good, okay? So again, the fact that there's an input that I can use to crash this code is not good. And this is why we wanna do something called input validation. So again, I'm gonna get the same problem here. Um, oh, it doesn't like this at all, does it? Okay. Um, right, so I, I, I have this, uh, you know, again, I have, a, I have a problem with, you know, uh, I, I have, I've crashed your program, right? If I, if I say, let's see here, new int uh, zero, then it's fine, right? Now, this is a little strange. I'm gonna get rid of this because this doesn't make sense yet, but then eh, it's like zero, so that's okay. So I do want you to understand that in Java, we distinguish between an array that's empty and this special null value that refers to an array that doesn't even exist, okay? This causes a crash. This is okay. Well, it would be okay, it's taking a minute to run. Yeah, this is fine. 
right? What do you think the uninitialized value of the array is going to be? Think it's gonna be zero? Oh, you guys are so hopeful. You guys are so hopeful, I like that. Nope. Oh, and now it's mad at me, okay. Well, anyway, I have to initialize it to something, right? So it turns out in certain cases when, you, when we start creating objects, I don't have to initialize this array, and it will be null. The default value for an array for any type of object in Java is null. That's one of the biggest problems with this value in Java, okay? So let's go back to our example. How am I going to fix this? I want to make sure that this code does not crash. What can I do? Yeah. Yeah, so let's, let's try this. So null is a value that I can use as part of a conditional statement. So to check for null, all I do is I say if numbers is equal to null. So if numbers is this special empty array that hasn't been initialized yet, what should I do? Now here's a good question. What's the sum of an array with no elements in it? I think zero is a pretty okay uh, thing to do here. Um, at the, towards the end of the semester, we'll start talking about errors in Java, and this would actually be a good place to, to generate an error, because this function should never be called with a null array. Like, whoever called my function messed up, and I should let them know that they made a mistake. But in the meantime, before we know how to do that, let's just return zero. That seems like a reasonable value, okay? Now if I do this, oop, don't do that. Now if I do this, I'm good. So again, here's my pattern at the top, and once we start to write more complicated functions, this will get more complicated, but the general pattern is at the top, check my inputs to make sure they're sane. Until I know that numbers is not null, I can't iterate over it down here. It doesn't matter whether I use an enhanced for loop or a normal for loop. I can't go through this array until I know that it's not null, okay? Now, you might want to check for some other things. Like, for example, if the array is empty, what should I do? I could, this code still works if the array is empty. So if I pass an empty array, let's do that down here, okay? So let's comment out this guy. Let's just go past an empty array. This is gonna work fine. That's okay. It just never goes through the loop. But what if I wanted to handle that up here? I could. I could say if numbers is equal to null or numbers.length is equal to zero, return zero. Ah, okay. So now actually we've seen one of our first fun examples of um, the, the power of how Java evaluates conditional expressions. Because the question is, why can I do this? Why is it okay, you know, in general, until I, like if I try, let me, let me do this, this will be fun. Let's do this in the other direction, okay? If numbers.length is equal to zero or numbers is equal to null, and then I'm gonna try my null value again. Oh, now I have a problem. So I can do, remember we talked about short circuit evaluation. This is safe to do. Let's get rid of the end. This isn't gonna crash. The reason it's because of how Java evaluates this conditional expression. So if numbers is null, it's never going to evaluate the right side of this. And so I'll never get a null pointer exception because I'm never going to try to get the length. So by the time I get to the right side of this conditional expression, I know that numbers isn't null. Therefore, it has a length problem. Every array has a length problem. So again, this is an example of that short circuit evaluation coming in handy, as I promised you it would. Okay, great. Let's. Uh, finish this, okay. In, so this is one of those places where unfortunately Java as a programming language shows its age a little bit. And here's what I'm gonna teach you. I feel a little conflicted about this, but here's what I'm gonna teach you. In this class, we are not going to use any fancy advanced methods for uh, avoiding null in Java. Those exist, okay? Um, we're not gonna use those and we're not gonna use those consciously, right? I know they're out there, um, and we could be using them, but I think at this point in computer history, it's still useful for you guys to get a feeling for how to work with null, because it's out there in the world. It is still haunting us. Um, 
we have found better ways to work around this. So again, if you go on and you use programming languages like Rust or Haskell or Kotlin or whatever, you know, uh, modern programming languages have a bunch of ways to avoid having to deal with this problem. But Java has this problem, okay? So I'm gonna teach you to be defensive about this. When we give you a function to write that can take a value that might be null, we will pass you that null value and you are expected to make sure that your code does not crash, does something sensible. We will normally tell you what to do if you get a null value, particularly on the homework. It'll say, if such and such parameter is null, do the following thing. So we'll tell you how to do it, but you need to implement the defensive logic. Can I be the only person talking in here? Whoever is doing that, I can definitely hear. Thank you. Just talk quieter, it's actually gotta be really loud. Um, all right, so let's talk, you know what? Maybe we'll do this on Monday. I'll do this quickly, okay. So if I wanna force, so we talked about the fact that Java will automatically convert ints to doubles because it's not losing any information. It won't automatically convert a double to an int because there's that fractional component that won't be preserved. But there are times in which I want to do that. And you know, this comes up in certain places. I'm gonna show you how to do this quickly, right? If I want to force Java to do a conversion that might lose information, I have to use what's called an explicit cast or an explicit type cast. So for example, on line one, I'm declaring a variable called i that's an int, I initialize it to 10. I can set a double to be that same value because no information is lost, okay? But I can't do this. Here, if I try to set i back to the value of a double, the compiler will complain. It won't do this for me. It's gonna say, hold on, you, you need to tell me that you know what you're doing. The way that I do that is by doing this. So here's a type cast. You'll see a type inside parentheses. What this tells Java is, you know what? I'm the boss and I know what I'm doing. So let me take this double value and convert it to an int. How is that gonna happen? Well, we can look at, let's play with some examples, right? Okay, so you'll see here that line three fails. If I pull out line three, everything is good, and I'll print out the result just so that we know that something happened. Right. So again, I can force this to, okay, so how do you guys think this works? Do you think Java rounds? Yeah, well, let's, let's find out. Let's, let's perform the experiment. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of this. I'm gonna use a literal. So let's try 10.999999999. Okay. Oh, oh, right, okay. I no longer have my int, so let's do this. Yeah. So what happens here is that the decimal is discarded. Java does not round for you. There are functions of Java you can call to get it to round, but it will not round when you do a cast. It just tosses the decimal point. It says, hey, you told me. This is what you wanted, right? And so off it goes. All right, so let's do a couple of problems quickly. We don't have as much time as I would have liked. I also have a couple of announcements interspersed in here, and maybe I should do those first, actually, because they're kind of important. We'll come back and, and do this in a sec. Okay. So. Like I said, this course works in layers. And believe it or not, we're actually in the third week. You guys have one more quiz next week and then a midterm quiz the following week, all right? So as we go, and particularly for those of you that have some background, you know, whether it's Python or a little bit of programming experience, um, here's what's gonna happen. Like, you're gonna be okay for a couple weeks, and then you're gonna get to one of the quizzes and be like, oh my gosh, this suddenly got really hard. The beginners in here are already there, right? They've been doing the work since day one, but some of you, this is gonna catch by surprise, all right? Um, you know, if I would, if, if I said something about the difficulty level of the quizzes, I'd probably say that it goes up until it hits the midterm and then it comes down a little bit once we start objects and it goes up again. So it's sort of like a sawtooth function that keeps going up and to the right, but when we start the second unit of the course and we start talking about objects, things get a little simpler for a couple of weeks. So these next, next week's quiz and the midterm are hard, you know? So let me tell you how to prepare for these quizzes. It's not hard. Go through the lecture slides. The lecture slides are the source of 
information about the multiple choice questions. All the multiple choice questions we ask are drawn directly from class. They're not tricks. They're, they were something that appeared on a slide, okay? Then, what do you do? You go to the Home 25 practice problem set. Those are the old homework problems and the old quiz questions. I'll start to release the old quiz questions. We still have a couple of people that haven't taken the first couple of quizzes, but once we get them through the system, probably next week, definitely by the midterm, I will have all of the old quiz programming questions as well that will be available for you to practice. So go do some of these, and then do them some more, and then do them some more. This is really the best way, because it's those programming questions that are gonna get you, right? The multiple choice questions, it's like, you know, fine, right? It's not worth that many points. The programming questions, you have a small problem, it can really slow you down. The other general piece of advice I would, or, I would say is don't get stuck, you know? I, I've had people that like got jammed up on one of the programming problems and they lost all the points because they just couldn't like, they couldn't finish it and they felt like they were close and so they just kept, kept submitting it over and over again and like, you know, 30 minutes went by and they ran out of time. Don't do that, right? If you get stuck, move on to the next problem. You might get that one right away, you might get the next one right away and then you can come back to the one you're stuck on and maybe with a fresh set of eyes, you'll see the problem right away, but you'll also have whatever time you have left to just bang on that problem, right? So, so don't get stuck. Okay, yeah, do that, do that, great. I put up a little algorithm here in pseudocode for you guys if, if you wanna figure this out. Okay, so let's do this. Oh, okay, other thing I wanna talk about just, just quickly, because again, so we have a very, I consider a very generous dropped grade policy in this class. It's on the syllabus, but there for every course component except the machine project, uh, there is a number of dropped grades. You can drop like 10 homework problems, three classes, three labs, three quizzes. You can't drop the midterms. That's the other component that's not dropped, okay? The, the, I don't, I think people misunderstand what these are for. If you're on a sports team and you need to miss class, that's what this is for. If you've gotta go home for a funeral, that's what this is for. If you got sick and couldn't attend class, that's what this is for. These aren't like, I get to skip some class and then when something happens that causes me to miss class, I need more drops. That's not how this works. We give everybody the drops and the result is that we don't give exceptions. So I'm not gonna excuse your absence in class. Just don't come and you'll consume one of your drops. Some of you, you know, are gonna use all your drops because you got sick one week. I'm sorry about that. It sucks to get sick in the middle of the semester. Some of you are gonna get to the end of the semester and stop coming to class for the last week. But you didn't get sick, you know? So, you know, life isn't fair that way. But by doing this, right, this really allows the course staff to not have to deal with this and it gives us a lot more time to do other things that are more beneficial to everybody, okay? So do not contact me about missing class. I'm just gonna send you a link to the syllabus that says, don't contact me about missing class. This is, you know, the policy, you're gonna use one of your uh, absences, right? So everything is covered by this, right? If you have to miss more class than this, then I'm worried about your ability to succeed in the class. That's why we, the, the drops are calibrated to, to achieve this result, okay? So again, please don't email me about this. You know, I, I know you guys are getting used to this, that's okay, I'm still getting a few of these, it, it doesn't take too much of my time, but you know, in general, it's, it's fine. You don't, you can't come to class, don't. Um, we expect you to try to do everything. We understand that there are some external forces that might intervene. Okay, so I'm out of time, unfortunately. If you guys want these, to, to see some of these problems done, um, let's start up a conversation on the forum. As a reminder, First MP checkpoint is due this weekend on your deadline day, whether that's Sunday or Monday, depending on which group you're in. I have office hours today in Siebel in my office, um, two, two, sorry, 2227, not 0403. I'll be in my office from one to three. Have a great weekend. I will see you on Monday. <laughs>